Hello everyone, our class will begin in uh, around one minute. So today we'll be talking about uh, introduction to Kantian probability in the in AMC 8 problems. Uh, today's problems will all be from 2005 to uh, around 2013. Next week we'll go over more challenging problems in combinatorics in the AMC 8 series. Seems like having a waiting room is actually kind of. All right, so let's wait for around like 20 more seconds. Uh, some more people are joining right now. Uh, by the way, sorry if you hear any background noise. Uh, there's someone power washing uh, their house in front of uh, near me. All right. All right, so let's start. So today, as mentioned, we'll be going over introduction to counting and probability in the AMC 8 series. So there are actually a couple concepts that I want to talk about uh, right before we get started. So first of them would be a com combination. Uh, combination uh, essentially where you have like, all right, sorry, uh, let me just write with my hand actually. So combination is where you have like m amount of objects or a set with m elements and you want to choose n of them. So you can write it as this. That's uh, the conventional way of writing it. I know there are like, uh, you can write it like this or like, like this. I'm not too sure uh, how other people write it, but essentially I write it like this. So now what does this mean? So when we have m choose n, what I'm referring to is Let's choose how many ways are there to choose n elements out of a set of m. So we would then have m factorial over n factorial times m minus n factorial. Uh, so for example, if I were to do something like, uh, let's say we ha I have five different uh, Skittles and I want to choose two of them as like an afternoon snack, right? So I would then have five, choose two. Uh, this is equal to five factorial over two factorial times uh, three factorial. Uh, so there are lots of interesting properties about combinations. For example, m choose n is equal to m choose m minus n. Uh, there's also a couple of different things uh, involving Pascal's triangle and also the hockey stick identity. I recommend you all um, looking at perhaps some AOPS of videos over this or uh, just Googling them yourself, since it's a bit hard uh, to cover all of them today, basically. So uh, first, that's combination, the first concept. The second permutation, uh, the second concept we'll use is permutation, which isn't uh, as useful or as wise, widely used. So it's essentially how would I order um, like X amount of things, right? Uh, so let's say uh, that in, there's a base there, M participants. And then out of this race, we, have, we choose N winners, where we have first place, second place, third, all the way to N place. Uh, and then the rest M minus N people don't get a place. So how many ways could we choose n winners out of m total participants? So for the first uh, for the first place we have m times m minus one, all the way to times m minus n. So essentially this looks like m factorial over n factorial. That's what a permutation is. All right. So now it uh, looks like uh, most people have joined already. So now let's start a class in earnest. So let's look at uh, the first problem of the day. So this is a pretty early on easy probability problem. So probability is essentially where you have uh, um, prob uh, probability of like X is equal to the number of desired events over the total events. Let's call it like Y. Oh, sorry. 
Okay. So now let's consider this problem. Keiko tosses one penny and a frame tosses two pennies. The probability that a frame gets the same number of heads that Keiko gets is. And then we have these probabilities. So let's consider our definition of probability again. It's the number of desired uh, outcomes over the total number of outcomes. The desired outcome is that a frame gets the same number of heads that Keiko gets. So we have in this two possibilities. So Keiko gets zero heads. Uh, his penny rolls, uh, flips a tail. A frame also gets zero heads. So this is one such uh, desired uh, outcome. The other outcome would be Keiko gets a uh, one head in a frame, also flips one head, his other coin flips a tails. So now, um, how would we find the number of uh, desirable outcomes over the total number of outcomes? So here we have the probability that Keiko flips a head. So that would be one half. So the pro oh sorry, uh, the probability that he flips the tails. So the desired outcome right here would be flipping one tails. That's one possible outcome over two possible outcomes. That would be flipping heads or tails times. A frame flips also flips uh, tails both times. So he gets like zero heads. So in this case, then we would have times one half times one half. So this case we'd have the probability would be one eighth. So the reason for this uh, would be because for Keiko's case, we have one desirable outcome, which would be uh, flipping tails over two, which would be flipping uh, either heads or tails. Uh, for frames, we also have a similar thing where we must flip two tails for this case to be valid over four total possibilities. One head, well, two heads, one head, one tail, one tail, one head, and two tails. All right, so that's our first case out of the way. Now let's consider the second case, and here I'll change my pen color. So now let's consider the problem, the case where Keiko flips one head, and a frame also flips one head, and he flips the other tails. So if Keiko flips uh, heads, then the the total, the desired uh, outcome would be he flips one heads, which would, which is one possible outcome, over the total two possible outcomes. Uh, the other outcome would be a frame uh, flips uh, one head, one tail, so that would also be one half times one half. However. We also have to multiply this by two, why? Because if a frame flips heads and then tails, that would be one case, or if he flips tails and then heads, that would be another case. So this is essentially equal to one eighth plus one fourth is equal to three over eight. So that's our first example. Does anyone have questions? All right, uh, I'll take that as a no, and it looks like there's nothing in chat. All right, um, so the, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about this case. Uh, so essentially what we want is um, the probability that Keiko gets a uh, tails and a frame tosses two tails. So what we're doing is, uh, what's the probability that Keiko flips tails? So that probability is one half, right? Um, and then uh, a frame also similarly has one half probability of flipping his first coin as tails, one half probability of flipping his second coins as tails. So together, if we were to multiply uh, the one half cube, uh, then that would basically uh, mean that Keiko flips tails, a frame flips two tails. All right, nice. Now let's move on to the second problem. Two dice are thrown. What is the probability that the product of the two numbers is a multiple of five? All right. 
So it looks like some people have gotten an answer already. So let's check. Um, so when we have, when we're talking about dice, um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Um, and then let's uh, list the table. One, two, three, four, five, six. So essentially, uh, what I'm trying to do with this is uh, essentially a times table, uh, six by six times table. And now uh, we want to find the probability that the product of two numbers is a multiple of five. So what's a characteristic of a multiple of five? It basically means five times n. So that means that uh, we only have to consider two special uh, places, this column, oops, and this row. So one, uh, so this is a multiple of five, this is a multiple of five, multiple five here, one, two, three, four. All right, here it is, here, 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 and here. So essentially what we have, oh, and right here as well. So essentially what we have is five, well, or sorry, six plus six minus one, that would be 11, or sorry, So uh, looking at this, we would then get 11 over 36. However, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry about the long pause. There was something out, uh, going on outside. Uh, so essentially what I did right here, and the reason why this solution is wrong is because I didn't uh, count. Uh, I didn't uh, count the twenty-five, or rather, if I was. Oh, sorry. So the reason why this is correct is because in the case where uh, you would get twelve or thirty-six, you would overcount the twenty-five. What you would essentially do is uh, you would have. There's a one six probability that you would roll five times one uh, plus one six, yeah. So essentially the answer is 11 over 36. A good way to eliminate this overcounting is because, oh, sorry, a good way to eliminate overcounting is by doing something called complementary counting. So complementary counting, as the name suggests, is a method where you take like one minus uh, the probability of an undesirable outcome. For example, the two numbers not being a multiple of five. So essentially what you do is you take uh, four over, sorry, five over six times five over six and then one minus 25 over 36. Yeah, uh, sorry about the diagram. It's uh, pretty bad. All right, let's move on to the next problem, problem 21. Harold tosses a nickel four times. The probability that he gets at least as many heads as tails is. So I want y'all to try this problem for uh, at least one minute and then uh, please put your answer in chat.
All right, now let's consider this problem. Harold tosses a nickel four times. The probability that he gets as many heads as tails is here. So what are the cases where he gets at least as many heads as tails? So let's consider the case tails and then heads, right? He can either flip heads or tails. So let's say for the first case that he gets zero tails uh, and four heads. Second uh, viable case would be he gets one tails, three heads, or two tails, two heads. The um, case where he gets like three tails, one heads, or like four tails and zero heads would not uh, work because the problem basically says he gets as many heads as tails. All right, so now let's look at these three cases. What's the probability for the first case where he gets zero head, zero tails, and four heads? So that probability would just be uh, one half to the four. So the reason why it's uh, one half to the fourth is because uh, there is no like uh, ordering that you can really do with this. You just get tails, uh, heads, heads, heads. Uh, there's only like one outcome out of like the total 16 total outcomes. All right, now let's consider where the case where he gets one tail and three heads. So similarly, uh, let's the probability he gets one tails is one half. The probability he gets three heads is like one half cubed. However, there's one key component here. So let's look at uh, the sequence, tails, heads, heads, heads. We can actually reorder this four different ways. How, you ask? We can have this. First, he flips T-H-H-H. Now he flips heads, tails, heads, heads. Next, he flips he heads, heads, tails, heads. And then he flips heads, 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 tails. So that's essentially four different outcome, uh, four different ways to order this. Uh, you can tell because you could just do four choose one or like four choose three, uh, whichever one works for you. Oh, oops, I also accidentally erased the case reasons too. All right, now let's look at the third case. Well, we have one half squared times one half squared times. Now, how many ways is there to order the case where we have tails, tails, heads, heads? Turns out it's six. Uh, this is equal to four choose two uh, because out of these four uh, spots, I suppose you could say, you choose two of these spots to hold tails and then the rest goes to heads. So this time is equal to times six. And then you could just do the arithmetic. So this is just one over 16 plus four over 16 plus six over 16. All right, so you see a lot of people saying uh, it's either B or E or maybe C. Uh, so hopefully my solution uh, cleared it up for you. Uh, for those of you who are still confused, uh, perhaps you could, uh, or do you want to ask any questions about this or did my explanation make sense? All right, uh, does anyone have any questions about this problem? Well, because I saw a lot of well, uh, different answers in chat. Oh, I see, at least as many. Yeah, I can see. Uh, misreading the problem is also like a big reason why people silly questions. I also like had a lot of problems misreading questions when I was uh, younger. All right, problem 16. So you have four people, A, B, C, D. They're going to drive to a nearby theme park. The car they are using has four seats, one driver's seat, one front passenger seat, and two back passenger seats. B and C are the only ones who know how to drive the car. How many possible seating arrangements are there? 
So I think this is actually a pretty interesting question. So let's start by drawing the car. So here's the driver's seat. It's very special, it's in purple. Now let's draw the other people who can't, the seats for the other people who can't drive. So our car looks something like this. And then we have like four wheels. Very quality car, amazing drawing, 10 out of 10. All right, so how many possible uh, seating arrangements are there? So let's first consider how many people can go in the front driver's seat. So since there are only two people who can drive, then there will be two right here. And then how many people can go here? That would be three, two, one. And then uh, all six. together, we get 12. Yeah. Two times three times two times one is 12. Yeah, I know. All right, so that's how you would get 12. Does anyone have any questions about this? All right, it seems like no one has any questions. Actually, if you have any questions about previous problems, you can also like uh, just message me. I'll also go over them with you. So now let's look at the next problem. This is actually uh, not that much of a combinatorics problem. I noticed that in the older AMC 8s, there's a lot of like uh, logic problems, uh, but this is kind of combinatorics since, um, since it's more of a pi question where we have principle of inclusion and exclusion. So let's look at this. The six children listed below are from two fam families of three siblings each. Each child has blue or brown eyes and black or blonde hair. Children from the same family have at least one of these characteristics in common. Which two children are Jim's siblings? Yeah, so this is a logic problem. I actually included it for fun because it seems to be pretty prevalent in um, early AMC 8 problems. And they seem to be making a comeback in like AMC 10, or at least I know there's like more logic problems recently in AMC 10 than there used to be. Or at least that's a trend that I noticed. I'm not sure if that's like an actual thing. So we have Jim who has brown eyes and blonde hair color. So who could his siblings be? So first let's consider if his siblings have brown hair, oh sorry, brown eyes. So the only other person who has brown eyes is Nadine. Uh, he's, he's supposed to have two siblings and if he has two siblings uh, that share brown eyes then that would be pretty apparent, but no. So now let's look at hair color. Uh, so his hair is blonde and the only other people who have blonde hair is Austin and Sue. So it'd be E. Yeah, that was like pretty funny problem, so I included it, why not? So now let's look at, um, yeah, what about eyes, right? So uh, the reason um, why Nadine couldn't possibly be his sibling is because children from the same family have at least one of these characteristics in common. That means that if his two siblings were to share the same eye colors, that would mean there must be two other people who have blue eyes, uh, sorry, brown eyes. Uh, very sorry about that. But uh, since no one has, since there's only one other person who has brown eyes, then that must mean that uh, their other sibling or Jim's siblings have blue eyes, right? So let's actually skip this problem. This is, also wildly not combinatorics, it's more of a logic problem. This is um, also kind of not that much of a combinatorics problem. It's kind of like a combination combo in number theory. Uh, so the problems that we won't be going over in class are mostly logic problems that I included because they were really popular, I guess, on the older AMC 8s and they kind of have to do with counting and probability. Uh, so I recommend doing them as homework or for fun. 
So now let's look at problem 17. Three friends have a six identical pencils and each one has at least one pencil. In how many ways can this happen? Right, uh, stars and bars, or sticks and stones, however you want to call it. So this is a great example of something known as stars and bars. So the principle of stars and bars, or the theory behind it goes something like this. Uh, so let's look at this problem. So we have three friends and they have six identical pencils. And each one has at least one pencil. If I were to do this uh, using traditional counting probability, not using stars and bars, then it would be actually kind of difficult, right? Um, so I would have six identical pencils, that's six. And each one must have at least one pencil. So like, let's say they own these three, and then how many ways can I order the remaining three between three friends? So this is where stars and bars comes in handy. So let's say that these three pencils are stars. Now, let's say that we have three or two bars. These two bars represent uh, how we can divide this, these three pencils. So for example, uh, if my bars were to be like right here, that would mean that uh, the first friend gets zero, the second friend gets one, the third friend gets two pencils. Uh, we can also order them something like this. Uh, first friend gets one, second friend gets one, third friend also gets one pencil. Or we can order them like this. First friend gets three pencils, second friend gets zero, third friend gets zero. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking five objects and then we're choosing where to place two of them. So it'd just be five choose two. So that'd be 10. Yeah, five choose two and five choose three are the same thing, by the way. Uh, as I said at the beginning of class, m choose n and m choose m minus n are equal to each other. So now let's move on to the next problem. Five friends compete in a dart throwing contest. Each one has two darts to throw at the same circular target, and each individual score is the sum of the scores in the target regions that are hit. The scores from the target regions are the whole numbers 1 through 10. Each throw hits a target in a region with a different value. The scores are Alice, 16 points, Ben, 4 points, Cindy, 7 points, Dave, 11, and Ellen, 17, who hits a region worth 6 points. So this is um, somewhat of a counting probability problem, also uh, number theory. So let's do it, why not? So let's draw our target. So first let's have this one, oh sorry, that's 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Oh, this is getting way too big, sorry. Let me just do something else. Let's zoom in a bit. All right, now let's draw. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Okay, actually, no, the target board is actually quite messy to draw anyways. Uh, so let's just carry on as usual. So the scores are Alice, 16 points, Ben, 4, Cindy, 7, Dave, 11, and Ellen, 17 points. So what score, uh, so what does Ben get? I actually want to give you all like around another 30 seconds to solve this problem. It looks like a lot of people are getting different answers. So uh, I'll just give you all like 30 more seconds uh, to get a final answer and then I'll talk about this problem.
All right, uh, give it like five more seconds, see if anyone else gets like more answers. Uh, so it looks like there's a lot of different answers in chat, all right. So let's first consider Ben. So you know that um, each person throws two darts. So what points did Ben get? He get, has to get one and three. Uh, so let's say Ben is blue. So he has to get one and three. Uh, the reason being is because um, if Ben doesn't get one and three, that means he must get two and two since he throws two darts. So now let's look at the next smallest person, Cindy. So how do you add two numbers equal to seven? We could have one and six, two and five, or three and four. One is kind of occupied, three already got hit. So then that means Cindy, whose color should be, I don't know, orange, why not, pastel orange, gets two and five. So now let's look at, uh, Dave. Dave gets 11 points. Dave gets green. Why not? How do you sum two numbers up to 11? Oh, you could have 1, 10, 2, 9, 3, 8, 4, 7. 4, 7 is the only possible and, oh, thing because like all the other numbers are kind of preoccupied. So now let's look at, all right, uh, Dave also has green. Now let's look at Ellen. Oh, sorry, Alice next. Alice gets red. So in order to sum two numbers up to 16, we can have six and 10. Uh, six and nine doesn't work. Six and eight doesn't work. Eight and nine doesn't work. So Alice gets six and 10 and Ellen gets eight and a nine. So this all works out pretty nicely. So then that means that Alice got A. Does that make sense how I broke uh, the numbers down? Um. So this, I think it would be best uh, if you start off with uh, people like Ben, uh, since he has like the least amount of cases to work with, I suppose you could either have one and uh, one and three or two and two. Two and two can't work, obviously. Um, it's uh, so I know some people uh, automatically said Cindy is equal to one plus six, but that isn't necessarily true. She could be like two plus five or three plus four. Um, first, you have to consider Ben. Now let's look at the next problem. Could it be zero and four? Uh, notice how um, the scores for the targets are the numbers, are whole numbers, one through 10. Uh, so zero can't be something. Or if he misses, I don't know. Uh, but they are all pretty good dart players. They all happen to land on the dart board. If it misses a board, that would be an entirely different problem. So two thirds, of uh, two thirds of the people in a room are seated in three fourths of the chairs. The rest of the people are standing. If there are six empty chairs, how many people are in the room? So this is also kind of a number theory problem, but I thought it was pretty interesting. So let's go over also, there's like an overabundance of number theory problems in early AMC eight. So I thought it would be nice to include in today's counting probability handout since it's also kind of counting probability, all right. So we have two thirds of the people in a room are seeing three fourths of numbers chairs. So let's say there are P people. Uh, purple, why not? So two thirds of the people. Exact same problem. Huh? I think I did the exact same problem. That would make sense. Since these are like uh, earlier AMC, so you might have done them in practice problems. And then two thirds P is equal to three fourths C, where C is the number of chairs and P is equal to the number of people. Uh, so the rest of the people are standing and we know there are C, uh, sorry, six empty chairs. So that means that one fourth of the chairs, the one fourth that are occupied is equal to six. So that means that C is equal to 24. So now 
Given that c is equal to 24, what is 2 thirds p equal to, or rather 3 fourths c? Uh, three fourths C is equal to. Please put it in chat. Uh, looks like no one is listening to me. How sad. All right, eighteen. Yay! Thank you for coming to my rescue. All right. So three fourths C is equal to eighteen. And since two thirds P is equal to eighteen, that means that the total number of people is equal to eighteen times three over two. Uh, eight, what's eighteen times three over two? Uh, we would then get 9 times 3, which is equal to 27. All right. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this problem? Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. Number 21. Spinners A and B are spun. On each spinner, the arrows equally likely to land on each number. What's the probability of the pro that the product of the two spinners numbers is even? So this is actually a pretty fun problem. I want y'all to get like two, uh, I'll give y'all like two minutes to do this. Uh, so there's two ways to do this really, direct counting and complementary counting. In my opinion, complementary counting in this case will be easier. Remember complementary counting is basically taking one minus the probability of undesirable. So P probability of not X. By the way, the exclamation mark in front of X means not X. It's uh, something you use in computer languages, right? Oh, I see a lot of people spamming E. How do y'all get E? Actually, does someone want to explain how, how they got E or how they got their solution? So there are two odd numbers for A and there are two odd numbers for B. Mm -hmm. So then we times two and two and we get four. So then there, the total number of cases is 12. So it's 12 minus four, which is eight and then eight divided by 12. Oh wait, it's it's D. Yeah, it's two thirds. That's why I was kind of, kind of confused why so many people got E. Yeah, uh, so that's the method to do is complementary counting. Uh, good job, by the way. Uh, that was a really nice solution. So now, I'll, uh, since someone already covered it using complementary counting, I'll do it with a slightly less nice case where I do it with casework. Yay for me. All right, this will be kind of convoluted. All right. So let's start with the um, first case. The probability that the product of the two Spanish numbers is even. So we can have even, odd, odd, even, or even, even. Those are the three ways to make an even number. So what's even odd? So the probability of an even number in the first spinner is one half. Probability of an odd number is two thirds. Uh, the reason why it's one half is because like there are two even numbers, two out of four times like two odd numbers here, one and three out of three total possibilities. Here, odd and even. Uh, probability of odd is one half. Probability of even is one third. Probability of even is one half. Probability of even in the second board is one third. So then let's just add these up. So that would just be equal to two plus one plus one. So that would be equal to four over six is equal to two thirds, yay. So that's how we get D. All right, so uh, does the direct solution make sense or should I elaborate a bit more? Uh, since it's kind of like, um, casework, which we haven't really covered yet. I'm not sure if y'all know uh, how to do casework. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, uh, please say so. Uh, this is where it starts to get uh, a bit more complicated in this handout. 
before we were mostly doing rather straightforward problems. All right, looks like no one has any questions. Let's move on. At a party, there are only single women and married men miss their wives. The probability that a randomly selected woman is single is two fifth. What fraction of the people in the room are married men? This is actually a rather interesting problem. So I actually want to give you all a one minute to contemplate about this problem. Try it out. I think it's somewhat fun. All right, so it seems like uh, there's a, most people think it's B. So now let's see, is it B or is it E? Or is it A or C or D? What a mystery, what a thriller, all right. So let's say that there are, oh, we know two fifths of, of the total like female population here is are single in this room. So that means three fifths of the women are married. So that means, uh, so let's say that the total number of women is W. So that means that there are two W over five total single women, three uh, W over five uh, married women, and three over five, three over five W married men. Because for every uh, married man, there's a married woman who's their wife. Now, on the other hand, if there's polygamy in this, that would be rather more interesting, but let's not consider that. All right. What well, fraction of the people in the room are married men? So now this is a number of married men. So what's the total number of people? So we have three fifths W over, how many total people are here? It would just be two plus three plus three over five, that would mean eight over five. W. So this is just equal to 3 over 8, and that's a fraction of married men. So that's one way to do it. Uh, another way to do it is the ratio of married women to, uh, sorry, the ratio of single woman to married uh, woman is 2 to 3. And then uh, since for every single woman, uh, sorry, for every married woman, there's also a married man, so it'd be 2 to 3 to 3. Uh, so this is a ratio of people, uh, so it just be 3 over uh, eight. You could also do it like that. Uh, do, so does anyone have any questions about this? All right, let's move on then. So problem 16. So this is actually, um, an interesting concept. Uh, it's a problem that introduces the concept called pigeonhole principle. Uh, let's read the problem first. A five-legged Martian has a draw for all socks. Each of one is red, white, or blue. How patriotic. What a very patriotic Martian. And there are at least- five... like that he doesn't even live in America, right? Mm -hmm. And there are at least five socks of each color. The Martian pulls out one sock at a time without looking. How many socks must the Martian remove from the drawer to uh, be certain that there, are, well, there will be five socks of the same color? By the way, um, actually, never mind. Uh, so we know that there are at least five socks of each color. And since the Martian pulls out one sock at a time without looking, how many socks must a Martian remove from the draw to be certain that there will be five socks of the same color? So let's consider this. Red, white, and blue. Uh, red are 
white, which we'll be using light gray and blue. This rather fetching color of blue, why not? So let's say that he first draws out a red sock, then a white sock, then a blue sock, then a red sock, then a white sock, then a blue sock, then a red sock, then a white sock, then a blue sock, then a red sock, then a white sock, then a blue sock. So, so far he has four red socks, four white socks, and four blue socks. He has no uh, sock where he has five socks of the same color. So then if we add, if he draws out another sock, it doesn't matter what color it is, he will have five socks of that color. For example, if he draws out red, then he'll have five socks of the red color. Uh, draws out a white sock, that would be five, uh, five socks of the white color. Draws out a blue sock, that would be five socks of the blue color. So this is essentially 14 plus one, that would be 13. D, all right, nice. Looks like everyone agrees. So I think y'all already know the pigeonhole principle. Uh, so good job, y'all. And now here, we have problem 21, which actually doesn't have that much to do with counting, but I thought it would be interesting to do anyways. How many distinct triangles can be drawn using three of the dots below as vertices? Actually, now that I think about it, uh, we're kind of low on time. We only have like 14 minutes left, so let's move on. Uh, since this actually isn't that really relevant to counting probably, I'll leave that as fun homework. So Jeff rotates spinners P, Q, and R and adds the resulting numbers. What is the probability that his sum is an odd number? So we have three numbers. How many ways can, uh, how can we get an odd number if we sum up three numbers? So you could have odd, 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 even, even, and that's it. So uh, let me actually give you a hint. We have a two case really, or odd, even, even. Of course, uh, those could be like even, odd, even, or even, even, odd. So I'll give you like two minutes to do this or to contemplate about this problem. All right, so let me first confess something about this problem. When I began, I was actually kind of tricking y'all. So when I said there are two cases, odd, 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 or odd, even, 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 odd, even, or even, even, odd, I was actually lying. So you see, if you look at uh, spinner Q, there's only even numbers. So like, this case can't work. And if you look at spinner R, there's only odd numbers. So this case also can't work. So you'd have to have even, odd, and then even, which is pretty sad, actually. Oh no, you didn't get a new teacher. I am still the same person. All right, so what's the problem that his sum is an odd number? So let's first consider 
this case. This is the only case, even, even odd. Oh uh, yeah, so the reason why my name has turned to Alphademic uh, Learning is because uh, Alphademic Learning now has uh, its own account. That has its own Zoom account, which is why I'm using. All right, uh, enough about that. So what's the probability that the first uh, spinner will give us an even number? So we only have one even number, that's one. So that's one desirable outcome out of how many total desirable outcomes? Oh, sorry, how many total outcomes? Three. And then multiply by even, right? So how many desirable outcomes are there? That would be one, right? Uh, we can't, there's, we can't get an odd number. It's very impossible. So like the probability we'll get an even number is one. By the way, any probability can be greater than one. And then uh, R, let's look at that. What's the probability of getting an odd number? Also one, we literally can't get an even number. So this is equal to one third. So it's equal to B. So now let's look at problem 21. So I'll give you like one minute to look at this problem. All right, so two cards are dealt from the deck, or actually let me give you like 30 more seconds to do this from. It's uh, not as easy as the last one. All right. Uh, so it looks like there's a couple more answers. Let me see if, uh, all right. So now let's look at this problem. Two cards are dealt from the deck of four red cards and four green cards labeled A, B, C, D and A, B, C, D. A winning pair is two of the same color or two of the same letter. This is a probability of drawing a winning pair. So now let's look at our cases. So two of the same color. So we can either have two red or two green. So those would our, be our two cases, but we could have like the same letter, uh, the two L. So let's first consider um, the probability that we get the same letter. So actually, we don't really care what the first card is. Or sorry, we don't really care uh, what the first two cards are. Because the probability of having uh, two letters would be one times one times one fourth times three fourths. Wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. Should, uh, that would, that's something else. So uh, the probability of having two, uh, of having two, num uh, two of the same letter would be one where we uh, deal a card from uh, any, where we deal any card, any card at all. It could be A, B, C, D, where A, B, C, D are red or A, B, C, D, where A, B, C, D are green. Oh, by the way, it looks like someone raised their hand. Does anyone have a question? Uh, you can always uh, private message me uh, if you have a question. All right. And then the probability that we get, that we pull a card that has the same letter. So that would just be, yeah, you can actually use complementary counting. One over, how many total ones are? One over seven. So it goes something like this. Let's say uh, from the first thing you pull A. Uh, let's say you have red A. 
So if you pull red A, then that means the other winning pair would be green A. What's the probability you pull green A out of the four green cards and the remaining three red cards? So that would be one over seven. One desirable outcome out of seven total. Yeah, you can also have red B, C, or D. Uh, I just said red A because it's arbitrary. I meant that if you have a red B, C, or D, it's also a winning pair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also a possible pair. Uh, so the reason why I said uh, one first is because I'm basically uh, saying you can either draw any one of these eight cards. So we have like eight cards in total. Any of these eight cards doesn't matter because you will always find, there will always be one matching pair that has the same letter plus. Now let's look at the other case where basically uh, we choose, we get two um, cards of the same color. So first, once again, we have one. Any card works. The first card we don't really care about times three over seven, because let's say we draw a red card. Then that means the probability of drawing, also drawing a red card next would be three over seven. There are three remaining red cards, four total green cards. So if we were to add this together, we would have four over seven, which is D. So it looks like some people are getting uh, E. How? Uh, I was wondering. Don't know how y'all got that. So does I don't have any questions? I can always approach it a different way. For example, like complementary counting. Uh, so it looks like some people are still uh, having a bit of problems with this. So uh, let me uh, go over this more explicitly. So we have two cards dealt from a deck of four red cards and four green cards. So how many total possibilities are there? So how many total outcomes are there? Actually, it's eight choose two. Eight choose two is equal to eight times seven over two, which would be equal to four times seven, which is equal to 28. It's not actually 16. Uh, the reason why it's not 16 is because you aren't necessarily doing something like uh, four choose one times four choose one. You're not necessarily getting two cards that are of different colors. Uh, there are actually 28 total possibilities. Uh, so let's look at it this way. You could either have, you could get 16 plus, how many ways could you get um, 16 plus? 16 would be the case where you have um, two cards of different colors. Uh, it's actually not 56 because I just did uh, HS2, but sure. Uh, because I wasn't really counting in order. So 16 plus, all right. So how many ways could you get four red cards? Four choose two. Four choose two is equal to six. And then green cards, also six. So that would just be 16 plus 12 is equal to 28. That's how you directly know that there are 28 total uh, outcomes, yeah. Um, by the way, um, if you were to do eight times seven, it actually, you could do this problem using permutations instead. Uh, but I'm doing it using uh, combinations. I can show you like a third solution using permutation if you want. So if we have 20 total outcomes, how many ways can we have, well, uh, two cards having the same color? So that would be the old six ways with uh, six ways for us to have four red cards with the same color. That would just be four choose two plus six ways for green cards, four choose two, all right. So now let's consider the possibility where we have like four of the same letter. So that would just uh, be four. So this would just be six plus six, 12 plus four, that would be 16 over 28. 16 over 28 is equal to four over seven. So that's a second way. 
So now let's look at it the third way, uh, permutation. I'm showing you all these different methods because uh, they're all pretty useful and there are different situations where you would apply them. And also because this is a pretty versatile problem, it's pretty common and it's best if we focus on problems like this uh, instead of other niche problems. All right. So now let's do it using permutation eight times seven. So our denominator is now eight times seven. So now our numerator, how many ways can we have four red cards? Uh, that have, or like where we draw two cards that are the same co color, namely red. That'd be four times three. Uh, since we would have four options for the first red card, three options for the second, plus four times three, four options for the green card, three options, sorry, uh, four options for the green card, for the first green card, three for the second, and then plus. How many options for the last two cards where they're basically the same color? So that would just be four. Sorry, not uh, time, plus four, it's times four. Four times four. So that's how I do it using permutation. So that would just be 12 plus 12 plus 16. That would give us 24 plus 16, which is equal to 40 over uh, 56, which is also equal to four or seven. Now let's look at problem 25. On a dartboard, we're shown this figure. The outer circle has radius six and the inner circle has radius three. If the three radii divide each circle into three congruent regions with point O, I just realized it's 132 and we're like two minutes over time. So do y'all want to go over this last problem or do y'all want to uh, do this as homework and the, all the remaining problems as homework? All right, sure. So it looks like y'all love math. Yay. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, I was going to say y'all didn't want me to go over this. Well, if I go over one more problem, then that's less homework for y'all. Um, on the dartboard shown, we have an outer circle with six, uh, with radii of six, and inner circle with radius of three. The three radii divide each circle into three concurrent regions with point values drawn or shown. The probability that a dart will hit a given region is proportional to the area of the region. When two darts hit this board, the score is the sum of the point values in the region. So what is the probability that the score is odd? So this is actually a pretty uh, interesting problem because uh, it's also not as straightforward as any of the others we did before. It's not that easy. But anyways, let's chug on. So what's the problem with that score is odd? How can we have an odd score? So remember, we hit two darts. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be in like different regions. Um, so let's see, score is odd. We could have one plus two or basically an odd number plus an even number. So uh, we can't have two darts landing in the same region because otherwise that would mean the score would be even since odd plus odd is even, even plus even is even. So we have odd plus even. So that would essentially mean landing somewhere in the ones times the probability of landing somewhere in the twos. So what's the probability of getting a one? The probability is actually equal to the area of this region plus the area of this region over the area of this plus the area of this region over the total area. What's that area? So the area of this red region right here is equal to one third times uh, nine over thirty six is equal to one third times one fourth is equal to one twelfth. 
Yeah, I know, class over already. Uh, I'm just doing one last problem. Um, so that's equal to 1 12th. So what's the area of this region? So um, the area of this, or the probability of landing here is just a uh, one third times 27 over 36, which is equal to one third times two over four, which is equal to one fourth. Uh, same with the other reflector region. So that's just equal to one half plus one twelfth. And this is equal to six over 12, which is equal to seven over 12. Uh, on the other hand, if we were to look at uh, the probability of landing in the two, that would just be five over 12 because it's this region plus this region plus this region. That's the area of the whole uh, dartboard minus the red region. So it's just five over 12. So probability is five over 12 times seven over 12, which would give us um, 35 over 72, which is this, all right. Uh, good job, y'all. So I hope you all learned uh, a lot today about counting probability and feel more confident in your abilities. So see you all next week. I'll be uh, I'll be uploading the video as well as uh, the handout. So see you all next week for advanced counting and probability. Bye.